So this particular gathering tonight is put together uh, by the House of Prayer. We're a little organization here, assembly at uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas. That's where this is being held, the area near Fayetteville, Arkansas. And it's a uh, religious organization, as it's called. And we put this together here and invited David Strait because we have heard that David Strait has some fantastic information to bless people in the areas of life as they interact with so-called government and potentially government and non-government, as you will hear tonight when he gives his presentation. And we're going to examine the things that he has to share with us and, and uh, the things that we can apply to our lives to alter our life and take the boot off our neck and to find uh, a freedom from oppression. That's what we're looking for in this hour. We've understood that he offers some information for people that are under the uh, heavy hand of child protective services and uh, child, uh, child trafficking information. At this particular time, I'm understanding that David has, is serving on two executive task forces right now, presidential task forces, one having to do with child trafficking, the other having to do with um, corruption in government, and uh, having been a, a Navy SEAL, an intelligence officer, and a deputy sheriff. Yeah, by the way, silence your phones. That's a good idea. It's a good warning. Good warning there. Um, having uh, served as a deputy sheriff and a part owner in a, um, what was it, David? Help me out here. Was it a mortgage company or a title company, you said? I started and ran 13 businesses. Started and ran 13 businesses. We're going to go ahead and give him the ear because he's got the experience to bring the message today. I'm going to tell you the, the outline of today. There's a bathroom up here off, to your, uh, off into the breezeway. There's also another two, two bathrooms downstairs. We're going to take a break in about an hour and a half for those of you that may need a potty break. And uh, we're going to go literally our, our message at 6 to 9. Uh, I'm, I'm, have, I'm happy to uh, have David present what he needs to present and answer any questions. We've got coffee and refreshments afterwards downstairs. So you can stay for uh, the presentation. Right now, we're going to just dive right in to let David take it, take it away with our presentation. Could you please give a warm welcome to David Strait? Thank you. That's enough. I don't like too much fanfare. I'm, a, I'm usually a really quiet, humble person. And uh, I've spoken to a lot of groups, so I'm not scared to speak of, in front of you. but. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't need any kind of recognition for what I do. I do this for one reason, one reason only, is because I love people. And I believe we have been under a system of corruption for far, far too long. And it's because of the lack of communication. I believe the people that founded this country were basically good, honest, and moral people who wanted a better life, and that's why they went through some extreme life struggles to get here and to do the things they needed to do. Do I believe they were all good and perfect? No. And I can prove they weren't. But they had a good, basic moral character. Do I need to move my mic or something? Yeah, I, I hear that bad. So anyway, uh, that's, that's going to be hard because I'm a walker and a talker. Uh, <laughs> anyway, there's certain things that I want to get across to you. One, I want you guys to get simple. I want you to get basic. And I say that coming from a position of somebody who used to talk really fast, walk really fast, do everything really quick. I could get out debate just about everybody on a variety of subjects. I'm very well educated. I've got five degrees. Why? I don't know. Just because I've been studying my whole life. I study three, four, five hours a day, sometimes till two, three o'clock in the morning. Every opportunity I can get, I study. Now, the problem with that is I spent 20 years in this business making it complicated. And I'm trying to drum this into Daniel's head a little bit. 20 years making it complicated. There's too many things going on out there, too many things happening. And we can, we can file writs of mandamus and habeas corpuses, and we can do all kinds of variety of things, administrative processes and stuff, and we can make this business incredibly complicated. Or we can solve it in five minutes, making it simple. 
Okay? That's the point I want to get across. I want to make it simple for you. But I'm going to talk about perceived power and authority. And I'm going to show you a couple of things, even a couple of things I didn't tell the guys last night, to kind of show you how we got to where we are today and how things have came down through history and the reason why we're so oppressed. I tra traveled the entire world, every, just about every nation, every continent for sure, just about every state, and everywhere I go, I realize one important thing. We're less free in America than any other country I visit, pretty much. We are less free here than just about anywhere in the world. I had 48 years of misconception of propaganda about China. China is a country with a huge population. Lots of cities of 10, 14, 20 million people in a city. And they got almost no crime. Very few police officers. Most of them, none of them that I saw had a gun on them. They're all standing on the street corners helping little old ladies across the street with their bags and helping tourists on directions. You never see a cop on the major freeways. You'll see a cardboard or plywood cutout of a cop car saying, please slow, slow down to protect your fellow neighbors. It'll say that. I went to lunch. Two-hour lunches with groups of engineers, very smart, intelligent people who are living in million-dollar apartments, who are making seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year American equivalent, who are driving seventy thousand-dollar cars because China puts a ten thousand-dollar tax on every vehicle, and they've got two thousand-dollar laptops sitting on the seat. The weather's warm. And their windows are rolled down, and the sidewalk's right in front of their car, and hundreds of people are walking back and forth. And we all get out of the car, and I know their laptops are sitting there, and they start walking into the restaurant. And I go, hey, wait a minute, aren't you going to roll up the windows and lock the cars? And they look at me, and they go, why? No Chinamen steal anything. They won't reach in that car. And I said, they won't. They won't steal anything? What do you mean? He said, because... 25 Chinamen walking down the sidewalk would tackle them, beat them to death, and hold them for the police. We don't worry about that. And we go in the restaurant, we're in there for two hours, we come back, and there's laptops. Car windows are all the way down. All the way. Not just this far. And nobody steals them. And during that two hours, I'll bet you 100,000 people walk down that sidewalk. I mean, they're 14 wide, going every which way. Lots of people. It's like New York at rush hour, times two. And nobody steals anything. They think it's a sin for their older people to die in the hospital. They have to die at home in their own bed, taken care of by their family. They take care of their kids. They take care of their elderly. What the heck's wrong with us here? That's what I'd like to know. I didn't know China was that way. I thought they were this communist country that our government sells us into. And I was an intelligence officer. I was in the Navy. I thought that's the way it was. Then I go to China, not once, two, three, four times in a period of three or four years. I go, wow, what a beautiful country. Now they do have some smog, that was a problem, but they're cleaning that up right now. And actually, right now, they're going through a little bit of a depression since Trump took office. But that's going to change. They'll pull themselves out of it because they're hardworking, good, moral, honest people. And the government is easy to spot. They all drive black Audi cars. Audi A7s and A8s and black Audi A6s. Depending on the ranking government, they get a lower number, see? And the higher number, the higher the rank. And they all drive these black Audis. And so the people, they just say, oh, yeah, they're a government guy. He get paid well, he leave us alone. They don't care. It's like they don't even exist. And they don't fool with them. 
unless they're doing something dramatic. They don't fool with them. The people in China are freer than we are. In 1992, Russia, Russia signed the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and they rewrote their entire nation's constitutions, and they started holding elections for the first time, and Putin was put in place, and his people love him, and they flourish under him, and he does well, and he's sharp, he's decisive, he doesn't let them get away with corruption, and so they keep reelecting him. They don't have terms like we have here. They'll just reelect somebody as many times as they think he's doing good until he's old and senile, and then they, they throw him out and put somebody else new. And Russia, since 1993, has been a freer country than we are. We get fed a whole line of crap, propaganda from our own government. I'll tell you what, I go to Russia and they're some of the smartest, nicest, sweetest, best people ever. And they take care of their neighbors, and they take care of their young, and they take care of their elderly. <clears throat> the misconceptions we have in America are unbelievable. We live under such a slave system, and other than the other 13 English commonwealths that are along with us, Every other country is pretty free. You can do just about anything you want. Here, you want to change a light bulb, you've got to get an electrical permit just about. You've got to tell your county what you're doing to build a shed, right? I mean, to fix your own sewer system, you've got to get a permit. You've got to get a license for something. You give every time you bow to perceived authority, you're giving up a right in exchange for a privilege. What does the word privilege mean? We all were taught what? That's something good. No, it's not. It's not something good. To have a privilege is terrible. It's a sin. It's to take upon sin is what a privilege is. We were all taught wrong on purpose. Let me give you a couple of, couple of uh, things in history that'll, that'll tell you this. In 1951, our federal government created this wonderful older school teacher lady named Jane Spaulding. And they paraded her around the country to all 50 states to sell the state governments on the auspice of <clears throat> standardized education and government funding to the schools and government funding to the states. My throat gets really dry because I got poisoned back in March, okay? So anyway, I apologize for that, but I'm going to be doing that a lot. So anyway, um, they paraded around for two years, and if you could close your eyes and picture the most perfect school teacher in your mind, that was Jane Spalt. She literally was next to perfect. And they said she was gonna be the head of the Department of Education. That's what she was sold on. So April 11th, 1953, they, the 50th state finally signed off, and they made Jane Spalding the head of the Department of Education. 49 days later, 49 days later, the President of the United States fired Jane Spalding and appointed Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller to run the Department of Education. And during his acceptance speech in front of the media, which was a group about this size, so if you were all media and I was Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller, this is about the way the group was. And he stood up there at the podium and he said, I consider this the greatest position in government. And the reporter's hand all shot up and the flash bulbs went off. And the first reporter asked, why do you consider this the greatest position in government? Greater than the president of the United States and the vice president? 
And he said, absolutely. This is the greatest position in government. And they said, why? Because you give me one decade, one generation, and I'll change the minds and therefore the direction of the world through the Department of Education. And it took him eight years. He didn't, it didn't even take him 10. After, by the end of the eighth year, every school in the United States had, I'm gonna call them propaganda textbooks. I can get any history book and I can tell you that the whole thing is full of lies. Stomp on it a little bit, and it's core full of lies. The bull crap will just flow out of it. And that's what happens, see? That's a, that's a problem to me, because I raised 10 kids, eight of my own, two adopted. Okay? And my kids all grew up to be very sharp, independent, well-educated kids who are taking care of their own family, and I've got 15 grandkids, and I didn't raise them very much in the public school system. The majority of their first 13 years, they were taught at home, okay? So, a couple other things uh, Nelson uh, Rockefeller said during that speech. They said, how much money did you make last year, Nelson? And he says, I made $140 million. I think the head of the Department of Education in 1953 was paid about 30000 somewhere right in that neighborhood. Okay. Why would you take a $30,000 a year position when you made $140 million last year? Anybody answer that one? if you didn't think you could change the world by doing it? It's the only reason, right? It wasn't for the money, <laughs> right? They asked him, how much did you pay in taxes? And he pulls an Indian head penny out and he tosses it in the audience and he says, not one red cent. That was a pretty racist comment. Today he'd be crucified for that one. But anyway, Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller ran the Department of Education for eight years. And our school systems haven't been the same since. Little tiny kids, every year they get up on stage four score and seven years ago, they talk about good old honest Abe, right? Man who never told a lie, his face is out on Mount Rushmore. See, I spent two years in the National Archives of Washington, D.C. I figured out the only way to learn history is to read letters and journals of people who lived during the time. Get their opinion. Put those opinions together and that's how you learn real history. Because you sure aren't gonna learn it in a textbook. A textbook is all lies, every darn word of it. So the first thing you do is throw away all those textbooks. Those are the books that should be burnt, all right? So, let's talk about good old Honest Abe, right? He was uh, a bar association attorney, lived in the state of Illinois. Go to the state of Illinois' website today. Go to the office of the Attorney General. Click on the History tab, and it says the office of the Attorney General of the state of Illinois was put into place to protect and uphold the interests of the Crown. The Crown, the Crown Inc., okay? Good old England and its monarchs. That's what the Crown, the Crown was a, the Crown Inc. was the very first corporation in the world, okay? So let's talk about Abe a little bit. He was a follower of Karl Marx. Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto in 1848. Okay. He passed a whole bunch of communistic laws that are still today screwing up Illinois. <laughs> okay. Terrible state to live in. And they're still screwing up Illinois. I'm going to be there on the 19th of this month speaking in Chicago. And he messed it up. 
He was a governor of Illinois, and he ran for president five times and he failed. Why did he fail five times? Because the people didn't like the communist Abe Lincoln. Ah, not the story we read in our textbooks, is it? Not the story at all that we put up on Mount Rushmore. In fact, he wrote a letter that said, if it was up to me, I never would have freed the slaves. Those are words right out of Abe's mouth. He never would have freed the slaves. Civil War wasn't even about slavery. It was about the Moral Act. Senator Morrill wrote an unfair tax bill that taxed the farmers of the South a higher percentage rate than the manufacturers and bankers of the North. So 11 delegates from seven southern states walked out of Congress, leaving Congress sin die. What does that mean? That's right. That means it died that day. Congress died that day. Another thing, how did he be finally become president on his sixth time? His opponent had $5,000 to run his campaign with. Abe Lincoln, because of the bankers of Boston and Chicago, Philadelphia and New York, had $7 million in his campaign. You know how much money, $7 million? $5,000 was a lot of money when somebody made 20 bucks a month. And Abe Lincoln had $7 million. So all they did is plaster his face everywhere. They put it on billboards, on the sides of trains. Heck, he, he paraded on a campaign on a train. A train would come into town, there'd be a stand at the back, surrounded by red, white, and blue, waving to everybody, shaking hands, kissing babies, right? And he became president of the United States, except for one thing. He couldn't be president of the United States. Why couldn't he be? Because the first Constitution had 13 amendments. The 13th Amendment was called the Tona Amendment, Title and Nobility Act, and no bar attorney could become president. So what did he do? First day on in the job. He signed an executive order bankrupting the United States of America. Next executive order created a corporation out of Delaware under the United States. He made himself a CEO. Not only that, he put the Grand Army of the Republic in charge by another executive order, and then he made himself Commander-in-Chief of the Army. That's why every president sworn in as Commander-in-Chief and President of the Corporation since then. Every president since then. No president before Abe Lincoln ever signed an executive order. Why didn't they? Because they weren't an executive. You can't be an executive unless you're an executive of a company. We had a de jure government up until that point. In 1861, it became de facto. A lot of people think it was 1871 when, when the District of Columbia Corporation was set up. But no, it started in 1861 with Abe Lincoln. Starting his first month in presidency, in 30 days he wrote 100 executive orders. No president prior to that had ever written one. 100 executive orders. You know what executive order number 100 is, anybody? That's right. It was the Libra Code. It put the nation under martial rule. Now that's different than martial law. Martial rule. Put the military in charge of the, com of the country. And until the Posse Comitatus Act, except for that act, military is in charge of the country. But because of that act, they're not allowed to get involved in civil matters. Ah, then how come I've had a provost marshal general in court twice? How did I get him involved in civil matters? Because I, don't, I said, I don't care if you know the defendant's name. I don't care if you know what, what he's charged with. I don't care if you know his attorney or any of, his, any of his actions at all. I don't want you involved in a civil matter. I said, I want you there because you're in charge of this judge. He's under your purview. 
and he's committing capital felony treason. Show up and watch. Okay? Show up and watch. Anybody know who Tim Holmseth is? You guys are sitting way too far back there. You guys in the back row, come forward, all right? Because I'm going to write stuff, and you're not going to be able to see it. I couldn't see it from halfway. <laughs> so anyway, anybody know who Tim Holmseth is? Nobody? Wow, that's a that alone is shocking to me. Tim has been a reporter for, an award-winning reporter for the last 10 or 12, 12 plus years. I know it's been at least 12 years, okay? And he's being persecuted right now in the state of Minnesota by an attorney firm in the state of Florida. And he's being persecuted in Minnesota for releasing information that was already public. Don't we have freedom of speech and freedom of the press? And, and all he's doing is releasing information that's already on the public record, and he's taking it and he's putting it on the internet and he's telling everybody about it? And they're persecuting him. You know what they did? They got a gag order, a, a uh, protection order against a lady who is committing child and sex trafficking in Florida, and she's an attorney for a big attorney firm in guess which county, Broward County, Florida, which is one of the most corrupt in the nation. And she is taking him to court every month. She's suing him for something to keep him tied up, spending his resources, spending his time, so he can't do any reporting because he called her out on something that was already on a court record down there. So it's not like he went to Florida and did investigative journalism and found out something that nobody else had. It's not proprietary information. It's public record. And he's just taking what's already on the record and putting it out there, right? It's not illegal in any way, shape, or form. So she sued him in the state of Florida, and his life was threatened if he showed up in court. He had never set foot in the state of Florida in his life, he's never been there. And his life was threatened, so he didn't go. And so they've got a protection order against him. He says, no problem, I'm not gonna go down there and bother you. He didn't think anything of it. So she's enforcing the Florida protection order in Minnesota, where he lives. Every time he puts something out on the internet. And they keep hauling him into jail. And I didn't learn about Tim until his second trial was coming up, after his first one. And the first one, he went there and he was railroaded and found guilty and put in jail for 45 days. And I went up there and I got him out of jail on the 41st day, whoop de doo I <laughs> saved him four days of his life, right? But then we walked out the door on the 41st day and the sheriff walked over and arrested him, hauled him back in the door. We didn't get 25 feet, and they arrested him. So I flew back home and started helping Tim with a little bit of paperwork over the phone, and his next trial date came up about 30 days later, and I leave Bend, Oregon, and I go, you know what? Kirk Pendergrass. Anybody know Kirk Pendergrass? You guys. All right, start watching Kirk's Law Corner. Kirk has an IQ of about 155. He's sharp as a tack. Everything he reads, he remembers. And the page number, okay? He's got one of those photographic memories. And he can read the law and know the law better than most attorneys. So I, I'm leaving Ben in a car, about ready to drive to Minnesota, and I call up Kirk and I say, hey, you got a bag packed? I said, I'll be there in four and a half hours. Kirk says, four and a half hours, that's not enough time, I'm not going anywhere. 
So I wait two hours when I get to Burns, Oregon. I call Kirk up. I said, hey, Kirk, two and a half hours away. I'll be there at your house to pick you up. I told him the situation. He says, okay, I'll go. Stopped at his house, picked him up. We shot up to Minnesota, right out of Great Falls, North Dakota, just across the border, a little town called Crookston. In fact, all three counties there have a population of about 10,000 people. It's almost to Canada. It's way up there, all right? And I pick Kirk up, and we show up with Tim in court, and Kirk and I stand in court under E-Clause LLC and presidential executive orders, and we speak an hour and 20 minutes on behalf of Tim. And in that court, we called the judge out three times on the record for capital felony treason, and it went unrebutted. He knew he committed it. So he dismissed the case and recused himself. 30 days later, they're hauling him back into court again. We've done this five times now, five judges. The last time, we had 150 people show up from all over the world. Court from England flew in to his court. And Tim didn't show. And he didn't show because literally on public television, they threatened to kill him if he showed up. So he didn't show. So we had a, a lawful strategic plan in place in case that happened. And Kirk went in the courtroom and took care of some business. The judge still issued a warrant because he didn't show. But when you read the warrant, you'll giggle. <laughs> it's only for a misdemeanor, and it's only good in that county in Minnesota. So as long as he stays out of that county, they're not going to pick him up. Right? So we've got him stationed in a safe house and he's fine. But we're just going to fight it on a higher level because they just, one judge after another in this courtroom, and they just keep committing capital felony treason. Okay? And they're doing that in every courthouse in the United States. Every single courthouse in the United States. Every day they're committing capital felony treason on you, on all of us every one of our neighbors that has to walk in that courtroom. And the problem is they've been getting away with it for too long, far too long. That's why we're really here today. See, we were at war. There are two wars going on in the world right now, and it ain't Afghanistan and Iraq. Okay, it's not with another nation. One war is going in, on inside that group, and the other war is going on between <coughs> the bankers have an army. They are called attorneys. The Bar Association works for the bankers under the Crown Inc. Versus we the people. This is the war we're fighting. Every one of us are fighting this war today. And it's a, one of the most costly and bloodiest wars in the history of mankind. You couldn't do this much damage with A1 tanks and howitzers as they're doing to us today. They're stealing our children, they're stealing our property, and they're stealing our lives. Many, many millions of people in our prison systems. And every organization like Harvard University, Cornell, Yale, have all done studies on our prison systems. These are them doing studies. And they've determined that between 41 and 69% of the prison population does not belong there, has committed no crime. 
41 to 69 percent, depending on which of those studies you read. That's half, let's just call it 50 percent break in the middle. Half of our prison population doesn't belong there. Right down the road here at this little gas station, when you walk in there to buy a body armor to the counter, and the counter is about this tall, and you put it up there, right next to it is a newspaper that they sell for two bucks, which is just a picture <laughs> after picture after picture of the criminals in this area who are being sought after by the law. Oh my gosh, I started reading this, some of those. I even grabbed it. She goes, that's two bucks. I said, I don't want to buy it. I just want to look at it. And I walked over and I started thumbing through there. And I'm looking at what these people are being accused of. At least 50% of them didn't commit a crime. And here's their pictures on there. Public slander. They're being slandered. Their reputations are being destroyed. A lot of them look like you guys, right? Because it could be one of us, right? Some sovereign citizen somewhere. We'll joke about that for a while. But there's no such thing as a sovereign citizen. We've had 44 out of 45 presidents stand in front of the cameras and say the people are sovereign. 44 out of 45 have said that in front of the camera. I know, I've read every presidential speech. Every one of them. Court back to Washington's. And the people are sovereign. I'm sovereign, that's why I'm using a purple pen. Right? I've got a purple pen in my pocket. All right? Dead is black, blue is contract, red is living, purple is royalty. Okay? Know your ink colors. They're important. They're important on your documents. Another thing I want to mention briefly is inside that circle, you could stick the name of any organization or agency in our, in our government, our perceived government. And right down the middle of that, you could build the Great Wall of China. And on one side, you're going to have order followers. And on the other side, you're going to have the best of the best of the brightest there are in their given field. People that have saved the world, saved you, every one of you, over and over and over again. I don't care if this is a CIA. Don't say anything bad about them because you're sitting here because of them. Otherwise, you'd be dead and buried. There are people in every one of those agencies who have saved this country single-handedly by themselves. And I can tell you story after story after story. I've told some of you already, some of them. Don't talk bad about an agency. It has nothing to do with agency. It has to do with you. Government operates through the consent of the governed. If I was going to rattle off about key points in about 20 Supreme Court cases, it would go something like this. Since governments have chosen to incorporate themselves, they must follow the same rules as any other corporation. That rules, statutes, ordinances, even executive orders, are not law. They are not law. They are corporate bylaws. They are for employees of the corporation to follow. Who are the employees of their corporation? You. Every one of you was made an employee. Very first day you were born, a paper was filed to the Department of Human Resources, the HR department, of the corporation. Just like when you go to work as an employee for any other company, you went to the HR department right after you were hired, before you could even start work. And you filled out all your forms and you did all your stuff with HR and you signed up for your health plan that 
probably didn't take effect for 90 days or whatever, right? All those things that you do. And the same thing happened to you the day you were born. I'm an ambassador for Voice of Youth and over 50 sovereign nations have me do their work. And it keeps me really, really busy. <laughs> besides this and besides getting over 270 children returned to their parents in the last two years alone. Okay. I don't need fanfare. But what I'm trying to say is this. It threw me off a little bit. Governments operate through the consent of the governed. To deprive us of our rights under the color of law, Title 18, Section 241 and 242, it's a conspiracy. It says that. The United States Code, get familiar with it. Because it was put there for one reason, one reason only. It's so we, the people, can hold these people plus these people government, accountable. That's it. It's the only reason it was put there. It wasn't for them to hold us accountable, but they tried to by making you an employee. How do they make you an employee? Why did I write it like that? Because city means municipal. Zen is society. It's a municipal society. You claim to be a citizen, you're claiming to be an employee of government. Why would you want to be that? Why would you want to be a citizen of anything? That's right. It's not in our textbooks, is it? Kindergarten through 12th grade, we didn't learn very much, I can tell you that. How many law classes did you have? Wait a minute, none. When you were 15, you got a permit, didn't you? From that moment on, you've been dealing with the law, and you didn't have a single law class? Just don't understand our education system. So let's talk about this one. You remember 1999, Bill Clinton sitting in front of Congress being interrogated and charged verbally with some crimes? I should say alleged crimes, because you know he never did that, right? This is Arkansas. I gotta be careful what I say in Arkansas regarding my friends, the Clintons. <coughs> anyway, the last day of testimony, he stood there all day and he played with a dollar bill. And he just played with it. He rolled it up, he did all kinds of things with it. He folded it and he creased it and he turned it over, folded it back and he just, until he got tired of listening. And then he held it up, just like that. And you could watch about 25 heads in the room, just nod. Congressional hearings are over, and he served out the rest of his presidency to 2001. He never had to say a word. He sat there all day, didn't answer one question, because he had the right to remain silent. Pled the fifth, but he held that up. Why? What's it mean? Let's talk about what it means. This world, there, and I wanted to start with telling you there's two of everything. There's two of you. There's your all caps name, and then there's your upper and lowercase first and middle name with your last name tacked on, okay? But there's two of you. Citizen, person, and resident. If you're any of those three or all of those three, you need CPR. Because you're, de you're dead. 
You're dead. All right, the dollar bill. The all-seeing eye is the Pindar. Pindar. This is the Council of 13. There's 13 bricks in that pyramid. The bottom half of the pyramid has 300 bricks. That's the Council of 300. If you draw an imaginary line at that first layer of bricks, and you draw vertical lines down, you can write the name of every organization on Earth on any of those lines. You could write the Masons, the Illuminati, the, the government of Fayetteville, and the government of whatever county this is in, and whatever state we're in, and, and you could write every government, every organization, every church, it's a 501c3, any major churches, Catholic Church, Mormon Church, Baptist Church, Protestant Church. It doesn't matter. You can write every organization on it. Even Christ was against organized religions. We need to meet as neighbors. We can hold church. We're in two or more gathered together. There am I also. I am a Christian. I'm a firm believer in the Bible. I'm a firm believer that there will attain salvation someday if we live righteously and that we can repent for our sins. But I'm telling you right now, even Christ knew man would corrupt any organization. As people increase in their level of power, they get greedy, envious, Prideful, just name any of the seven deadly sins, right? And then some. And that's what happens to them. And the minute they do that, they go up into this pyramid that is controlled. And that's what's wrong with every organization on earth. Now, I'm not saying every single one of them are, but I'm saying there's a heck of a good chance See, everything in life is about good versus evil. One third of the hosts of heaven were what? Okay. Good versus evil. Citizen, person, or resident. It's three things that are we never want to be. In fact, in the book of Job, and five other authors in the Bible have distinguished clearly between a man and a person. Job 32, 21, what's it say? It says, be the man and not the person. 22, it says, don't put the flattering titles upon a man of a person. We never want to be persons. We're not persons. We're people. Why did our founding fathers say, we the people? We the people created government. We, lay, the people, laid down the law. And right now they're sure stepping outside of their scope and authority that we, the people, laid down. So why? Why are we, we, the people? Every one of our documents that we file in court should say, I am a man, a living soul, a son of God. I am one of we, the people who created government. There's a maximum law that says that in which one creates, one controls. You want to control our perceived authority? Then you better be a we the people, which means not a citizen, a person, or resident. So you need to repudiate your citizenship. In the United States Code, in Title VIII, Section 1101, it says... This is the definitions of statuses in the United States. Everything in the law is about status, standing, and jurisdiction. Status, standing, and jurisdiction. You don't even know who you are. None of us. 
in kindergarten through 12th grade, which I'm assuming most people have, were you ever taught that there's a whole bunch of different statuses? Lots of statuses. Why do you think Hillary Clinton's never been arrested? Because we physically have to have proof and evidence of her physically harming another person. Why? Because she knows her darn status. She's an American state national. She's an Arkansas. Not anymore, right? They should move the heck out of here. You guys kick her out? I hope so. All right. That's why she's never been arrested. She has the dirty work done. She doesn't do it herself. Right? How do you prove that she's harmed another person? She doesn't do it herself. It takes some pretty good evidence. And everybody complains, how come we haven't arrested Hillary yet? Nobody would like to see that more than I would. <laughs> Nobody. But we haven't. I don't like talking politics. But, that wasn't politics. huh? That wasn't politics. Thank you. Standing. All persons are equal in the law, rich or poor, black or white, doesn't matter. It's a little, little quote the Bar Association likes to throw out there occasionally. Another one they throw out there that they don't like to admit to, but they print it in their ABA journal every once in a while, is no fact or truth shall be tried in court. It's a nice little motto, right? No fact or truth shall be tried in court. Because they base everything off presumption, assumption, and hearsay. Jurisdiction. Probably one of the most misused words in the law by our attorneys. By our attorneys. The army of the bankers. No, an attorney, he was standing... Just past the bar exam, he's standing in, in Seattle at the Space Needle. And he's up on top at the restaurant. They just had a big meal celebration. And he's standing there and he's looking out the window. And one of the older attorneys came up to him and says, you see all that out there? You see all those powerful corporations like Microsoft and all that? See all those? Guess who controls those? Not the CEOs. Every one of those guys run to their corporate attorney. The attorneys control those corporations. Not the CEOs of the company. Not their board of directors. They don't do anything until they run it past the legal department. Not a stinking thing. And he realized that day he shouldn't have never became an attorney. Because he didn't want anything to do with that. You see, he's taking away somebody else's control and authority. Can you all hear me? I talk quiet. Yes. Okay. Every organization on earth. What does the word attorney mean? Look it up in a legal dictionary. It says an actor to a turn. That's the definition of an attorney. An actor to a turn. What is the legal definition of an actor? It's someone who gets up on stage and lies convincingly enough to make you believe in the character and the plot. Yeah, somebody who lies convincingly enough. What does to a turn mean? It means to steal from one and turn over to another. So by the very definitions of their professions, they're liars and thieves. Let's bankrupt them all and make a pact. Never hire an attorney for anything. You don't need it. Because it takes three signatures to steal your life. It takes the judges, the prosecutors, and your attorney or you. Your attorney or you. That means you, if you're in jail, it's because you signed a plea deal or your attorney signed your bond for you that put you in jail. So if you hired an attorney thinking he's going to protect you and get you out of jail, uh -uh. see, I've gone to federal courts 
where someone's actually been tried by a jury and found guilty of felonies, and I meet them right after their trial and before their sentencing, and we walk in and we nullify their trial and their sentencing. How do we do that? We fire their attorney. If you have an attorney, you are a ward of the state, a ward of the court, you're incompetent and unable to speak for yourself. How many of you want to be that? If you hire an attorney, you're incompetent. You're infirmed. You're a minor or a corporation. You are not a man or a woman. They cannot represent a man or a woman. Did you know that? It's against the law. It's against the law for any attorney to represent a man or a woman. They can only represent your entity, your person. You're incompetent, you're infirmed. It says that right in their laws. Who can an attorney represent? A minor, a corporation, a person, somebody incompetent, somebody infirmed. That's it. So you fire their, your attorney. You don't sign anything. And you make sure you are competent. Could be right, could be wrong. Competent. I've never been a good speller. Actually, when I sit down and think about it on the computer, I'm pretty good. But when, when I'm up here, I'm thinking, of, I'm trying to think ahead of myself. So I get it wrong. If you are competent, and you don't sign anything, and you don't have an attorney, you can't go to jail. Then you go home. Now they can throw you in jail for contempt. In fact, they can throw you in jail for contempt three times. They can fire, throw you in jail for contempt. To try and force you to have an attorney. They can throw you in jail for contempt to try and force you into a plea deal. And they could throw you in jail for contempt to get a incompetency hearing. Now the problem with incompetency, it's a two-edged sword for the, the court. So they, they were, believe me, they want you competent, except in the state of New York. They want you competent. In the state of New York, they want you in conference because they make a lot of money off mental health facilities without even being sentenced, without a trial, without due process of law. They can put you in a health, mental health facility for a year. I just tell people to tell them, wait a minute, I went to a government funded and controlled school system for 13 years and I got a certificate of competency called a diploma. What do you mean I'm incompetent? I filed all these documents, sue juris on my behalf in this court. What do you mean I'm incompetent? I got this degree and that degree and I've been a successful businessman. What do you mean I'm incompetent? And the judge goes, crap. I can't find him incompetent. So that's one of the easiest things to get around is to make sure you're competent. So be competent, don't have an attorney and don't sign anything, don't go to jail. It's that simple. Even after you've been tried by a jury and found guilty, you'll stay out of jail. Save the lady 20 years of her life for four felony counts of fraud. Gina Nilsson, I saved her five years of, the life, of her life. Stephen in Utah, forget his last name, he was going to go for life, life, and he didn't do anything. They manufactured his case, and he never spent a day in jail. Gina spent 
spent almost 90 days in jail, uh, 80, 87 days. Because in Utah, they can hold you in jail up to 30 days for contempt. Most states, it's like 72 hours. But in Utah, it can be up to 30 days at a time. So they hauled her to jail for 29 days to try and force her to have an attorney, to break her down, mentally and physically break her down so that she had to accept an attorney. And on the 29th day, they hauled her in for a hearing. And she said, no, I'm not going to have an attorney. They put her back in jail for contempt for 29 days <laughs> to try and force her into a plea deal. And every time they walked in with a piece of paper to sign, she said, no, I'm not signing nothing. They threw her back. She went in for a hearing. They said, we're going to order a competency hearing. We're going to send a psychologist over to the, to the jail. He walks through the door. And she goes, you realize I have a degree in psychology, right? She goes, you realize I have two businesses that I run and operate. You do realize that I filed over 700 pages of documents in this court, right? He goes, you're competent. They hauled her back in for the hearing. It was over in five minutes, and she walked out and hugged her mother. I got a picture of it on my phone. She was already tried by a jury and found guilty. Okay, three sentencing hearings, three. And she was thrown in jail for contempt at every sentencing hearing. Because they can do that to try and force you, to break you down mentally and physically. <clears throat> Here's a line I want you all to know, first of all. Anytime you're dealing with authority, try to shut up. Don't say anything. That's the first thing you got to try and do. Because you will incriminate yourself every time. So try not to say anything. I know people that have been arrested, strapped in, thrown in the back of a car, hauled to the jail, gone through interrogation, and they let them out because they didn't even say their name. They just zipped their lip, didn't say a word. And then they go home. I know quite a few people that that's happened to. You know somebody that happened to. See, so that's the first thing. Second, if you do have to say something and deal with them, be nice. Every one of those agencies, there's good people in, even our police departments. There's a lot of guys that started when they were this young saying, Daddy, I'm going to grow up to be a police officer so I can help people. And they don't realize that the one they get in there and they get on the job, that they're nothing more than a policy enforcement revenue collection agent because that's what they are. Police means policy. Doesn't say law officer. Doesn't say peace officer. In fact, the Supreme Court has ruled several times now that they're not there to protect the public. Not only that, they're all private for-profit entities. You guys ever run a Dun & Bradstreet number? Or a Manta.com report? on your city of Fayetteville, or on the county of whatever this is, or uh, on the police department, or on the courthouse. I proved in the first district court of Cache County, Utah, that seven county courts in Utah were owned by one man whose headquarters offices was in Ogden, and he owned them just like a McDonald's franchise. You think they're government? On June the 20th, I was meeting Melania Trump in the Rose Garden. I'm on one of her task forces. And we talked for about 20 minutes, and it was real nice, and talked about a lot of different things. She gave me a little letter thanking me for the evidence that I've turned into the Pentagon has resulted in the arrest of more than 3,000 child and sex traffickers this year since March. Okay. But President Trump came by, and I'll wear my hat tomorrow that he gave me. President Trump came by, and 
said some nice things and gave me a hat. And I'm thinking to myself, what can I tell this man? Because I'm not going to get much time with him. You know, you're only going to get a little, little bit. What can I tell this man that's going to make some kind of a difference? And the only thought that came to my head was this. I said, President Trump, our 2018 census said there's 327.2 million people in the United States today. And the corporate charter that set up this corporate government, the Constitution, says there's supposed to be one representative in Congress for every 30,000 people. I said, that means we need 10,907 congressmen. And we have 435. And Congress operates off the Mason's meeting manual as their book on how to conduct their meetings. 435 out of 10,907 is not a quorum. I said, they're dead. Their sin die. I said, no law that they pass, no executive order, no nothing that Congress does or the Senate does or any law that's written or approved means anything because there's no quorum. There's no lawful government. Everything is de facto, which means without fact. It's all de facto. They operate through the consent of the governed. And he looks at me and he says, you know, I know that. And you're right. And he says, that's why I signed executive order, and I can never remember the numbers, blah, blah, blah. Restoring the Republic of the United States of America, and now it's up to you. And I, I just about burst into tears. I said, geez, he knows our government has no authority to even exist except through the consent of the governed by the unknowing and uneducated, and it's, believe me, I'm not blaming anybody. It's not your fault. We were all educated through the same system. And we're all just compartmentalized legal idiots, and we're stupid. And that includes me. The smarter I think I am, the dumber I know I am. <laughs> okay? And I'm the first to admit that. But... Yeah, a lot of them. A lot of them. Yeah. Lot of them. Okay. Evidence I turned in is the reason Epstein went to jail. Do you think he's dead or is he going to testify? He is absolutely dead. So we lost our most important witness? No. We have all of his evidence. He doesn't matter. He doesn't matter? Okay. No. We would have killed him anyway. You have no idea how many people that we go in their house in the middle of the night and we pick them up and we take them to the nearest military base and we put them on C-136s and they fly directly to Guantanamo Bay. And they're tried under the UCMJ, which is much tougher than the Department of Justice. There's four of us on this task force that collect this evidence in the United States. And we've arrested over 3,000 people since March. In that same period of time, the Department of Justice, which has 400,000 people, 100,000 to one, has arrested 1,700. Okay? The difference is the authority in which they arrest. If the Department of Justice arrests, arrests them, they have to go through a court system, a trial, and they pick a judge who's probably a pedophile. And they pick a prosecutor who's probably a pedophile. And the black robes, there's a reason they're not white robes. Okay? It's good versus evil. There's a real reason they're not white. Our biggest criminals sit on the bench. And even bigger ones are prosecutors. Okay. Once they've reached that position of power, now nah, I shouldn't say that because there's a lot of good ones still. I, I've won judges over to our side. Okay.
but the majority of them. There's a reason they're there, and there's a reason they're wearing black robes. Understand they are in a for-profit system. What is a court? What is a court? Anybody looked in Black's Law Dictionary, maybe fourth, fifth edition, under the word court? It says C Bank, C Post Office. All courts were set up as the United States District Postal Courts. Benjamin Franklin set up the post office as a bank. Its currency was its stamps and its money orders that were backed by gold and silver. The post offices were banks. These were all post roads. Every road in the United States was a post road. Still is, believe it or not. They're post roads. Postal system was banks. This country was founded on banking. Banks. Still banks. Still founded on banks. Every act of Congress between 1908 And 1933 was put into place by bankers to enslave you. Every act of Congress. Look no farther than Edward Mandel House, a rich Texas oil billionaire who had never served one day as an employee of government, but had the ear of presidents and bankers. He was a billionaire, and he had the ear of presidents and bankers. How many people know about Jekyll Island? Most people in this room, probably, because you've been studying it, right? Jekyll Island. Edward Mandel House got the bankers together, and they all met on Jekyll Island. And they come up with a way to enslave you all. And he had the ear of President Wilson. And they set up the IMF and the World Bank and the Federal Reserve and the Council on Foreign Relations and, and many, many banks and bank organizations. And they set it all up for a system of slavery. They set up our United States Treasury. The Secretary of the Treasury does not get paid from the United States government. What's that? The International Monetary Fund is where his check comes from, okay? The International Monetary Fund, that's where his paycheck comes from. One cannot serve two masters. Same with your county sheriff. Where's his check come from? I don't care if we the people elected him. Don't think he's ours, because you you're not writing him a paycheck every month. His check comes from the county of a private for-profit corporation. He enforces policy, okay? There are no constitutional sheriffs in this country, even the few that think they are, and I've had this conversation with a lot of them, okay? When it comes right down to it, they must enforce policy. You know who came to the Deschutes County Sheriff's where we were all sitting here 114 sheriffs in that county. I was one of them, my wife was one of them. I, we joined because I wanted to help save people. I, I wanted on the search and rescue team. We have, a lot, we have mountains in Oregon. I don't know if you've ever been there. They're not like these little mole hills around here. You know, out, off my deck I can see like 11 snow-capped peaks that go up 12,000 feet, okay. So people get lost. In fact, last week or two, they just found a hiker up on Mount Jeff that disappeared three years ago. But the snow melted enough this August that he appeared, <laughs> right? Three years he'd been up there under that snow. So, most summers it doesn't melt off, okay? Mount Bachelor gets like 100, uh, Mount Bachelor's 40 minutes from my house. I can jump in the car and be up there in 40 minutes I can be down here swimming in a swimming pool in 80 degree heat and I can go skiing in 40 minutes. 40 minutes. All right. So anyway, that really threw me off. <laughs> What's that? Sheriffs. Sheriffs. Okay. Let's hold court for a minute. Who wants to be a judge? 
I'll pick one then. All right? Doesn't matter. All you can be judges. See, here's the thing. You can, you can stand up there as a next friend or lawful counsel with a friend of yours. You don't have to be a bar attorney. No bar attorney is licensed by the state. They're licensed by the bar. It's a labor union. They're trying to form a labor union monopoly. In fact, we've gone, President Trump signed an executive order asking we the people for help. A couple of us took him seriously. Chris Howlett, anybody know Chris? Guy from Florida, Chris Howlett, he was an attorney. But a good one, one that we've won over to our side, right? And he quit being an attorney. He set up a company called Eclaws LLC. That's his law firm. But no bar members work for his law firm. He helps people without being a member of the bar. And he took President Trump seriously. And he wrote a brief. And he sent it to President Trump. President Trump calls him up and says, hey, read your brief. How would you like to come speak in front of Congress? And Chris said, yeah, OK. <laughs> you know, turn somebody like that down, right? And Chris went in front of Congress, and he stood up there, and he says, the Bar Association is a monopoly. We do not allow monopolies in the United States of America. I would like you to collapse the monopoly. But I know most of you are bar members, and since you're not going to, and he looked them right in the eye and told them that. He knew they weren't going to. He says, you need to open the practice up to everybody. And my company, Eclaws LLC, should have the authority to stand up in court in any courtroom in the United States that I register my company as a business in that state to practice law just like a bar attorney. And guess what? They signed off on it. And Kirk Pendergrass and Chris Hallett and John Gentry out of Tennessee and a few people that I know besides them all work for Chris Hallett and they go to courts as non-bar association attorneys. And so when Kirk Pendergrass and I walked in with executive orders and slapped them on the judge's podium and said, we're going to be helping Tim Holmseth, he just went, uh, 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 he couldn't think of anything to say. So we talked for an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Yeah, it was. And it was a sight to behold. And the people in the audience, we got them all to do affidavits afterwards, testifying to what they heard. And we got their, we got their, uh, court transcripts because we called them out for capital felony treason three times and it went unrebutted. Do you know, understand what that means? Nobody objected from their side. They agreed. So the judge recused himself and dismissed the case. Now they're still after Tim, but it doesn't matter. They conceded, right? Now we can tell everybody because it's public record. They conceded. If they concede once, they're going to concede again. Now let me tell you something. I went up to Washington State and I was teaching a group about three times this size. And there was a couple of judges, a couple of attorneys, and a couple of legislatures in the room. And you know what? In Washington State, they put a bill in front of the legislature to declare the Bar Association a monopoly and open the practice of law to everybody. Hasn't passed yet. They've tabled it. <laughs> but it went there. And it was talked about and discussed. And it's been talked about and discussed two or three sessions. That's important. Okay. Well, oh, a couple years ago, I went to Alabama. And I... The Tenth Amendment Society, group group of people just like you, calling themselves the Tenth Amendment Society, got me down there, 
And I gave a talk just like I'm giving today, pretty much. And they started learning from me. And I've been sending them emails and all kinds of stuff. State of Alabama is passing laws right now. Alabama is leading the pack. They're going to be the most conservative constitutional state in the country pretty soon. One of the things I talk about is our marriage licenses and the story of a mother. Very important story everybody should know. And I talked about marriage licenses and what that means and what that is. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And if I can assign somebody pretty soon to erase this board so I can start over. U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. The states patented a marriage. Did you know that? They patented how they can screw you, mess with you through a marriage. And if you look at the blueprint that goes along with the patent, because when you're patenting a process, you have to put a blueprint with it. The blueprint looks something like this. Hope people can see this back there. The state is the primary contract holder in the marriage the minute you apply for the license. They join with the husband, which is animal husbandry. Never call your spouse your husband. And never call her your wife. You're a mate and a helpmate. Okay? A man and a woman. And they enjoin with the wife. And there's nothing that connects them. Nothing. A dashed line, they write the word God on the dashed line. Any architect and any engineer will tell you that a dashed line on a blueprint means a beam that bears no weight. They took God out of the contract. He bears no weight in the contract. And the husband does not interact with the wife except through the state. How do you like them apples? They're not very edible. Pretty sour and bitter. Okay? That's the blueprint of a marriage. So the state of Alabama... I'm finishing up on this. State of Alabama, in my talks that I've been doing for about the last three years, I tell people how to properly get married. And that is with a family Bible. It costs you about the same price or less than a marriage license. And you get a family Bible that has the extra pages in the front and the back. And that's where you record your family events. Childbirths, marriages, all those kind of things. You record the event. Daytime, place, who's in it who's officiating it, and get a couple of witnesses who attend signature. And then you take your Holy Bible with the stuff that's written in it, the event that's written in it, and you take a copy of it, and you go record it at your county courthouse. Now, in the state of Alabama, they went through this process. They took me seriously. And they said, well, the state of Alabama will no longer issue marriage licenses. Isn't that cool? You get a family Bible, you record the event, you take it to a probate judge in the state of Alabama, and he will properly publish it and properly record it. And it is public law 97-280 by Congress that the Bible is the law. Does it matter what religion? Take the Torah. Right? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. But the Bible is recognized. We have freedom of religion in this country. It doesn't matter what religion. Okay.
I've written this about a dozen times, and I keep slightly changing words on it. In one of my classes, there was somebody listening whose name was William Moffat. William Moffat is a very famous name in the United States. There's been five generations of William Moffats, and every one of them has done something extraordinary and special. But about 30 years ago, the most recent William Moffat, who's now 70 years old, retired and living in Montana, started the World Benefit Church. And he created an organization called Voice of Youth. And he did it for one reason and one reason only, not to have a congregation of people that he's teaching every Sunday, but to be able to go to governments all over the world. He's been to every country and spoke with every world leader for the last 30 years. And he spoke at The Hague in front of the United Nations and the United Nations Human Rights Division. And he has spoken on behalf of the children and their families. And William Moffat listened to one of my classes. And he bugged me for about three months, thinking that I didn't have enough time on my hands. And he made me an ambassador of the voice of youth. And he did it because of this story. And this is a story that we all ought to know, we all ought to print out, and we all ought to share with every man, woman, and child on the face of this earth, especially in the 197 United Nations countries that have been under the Crown Inc. rule. Okay? A mother, nine months pregnant, and about to deliver her precious child, unknowingly walks into a foundling hospital a foundling hospital. All hospitals in the United States in 1908, remember I had 1908 to 1933 up there? In 1908 was designated hospitals and churches as foundling hospitals. What is the legal definition of the word foundling? It is a safe place to abandon a child. Somebody can walk in with a child, set it down inside of a hospital or a church, and walk out with no repercussions. Yeah, oh my, right? I heard that. Okay? Foundling Hospital. One of the first acts of Congress that had to be put in place in the United States. Now, everything in the United States is also in England and Canada and Australia and Ireland. And, okay? I can go on and on and on. It just happens at slightly different times. Okay? I can show you where just about every law in America is a law in England. They usually preceded us by a 200 years to 150 years to 50 years. They, they did it first, but we've adopted it. Okay. <clears throat> the mother goes through a major medical procedure, commonly known as childbirth. She is in extreme pain, which means she's under duress. I want you to listen carefully to the words I'm using. Often, under the influence of painkillers, just happily looking forward to getting home with her bouncing baby. When she is brought and handed a stack of papers to sign and merely told, now I've given this speech in front of nurses before, and they say that's exactly what we're taught to say. Merely told that these are just to give your baby a name and register it with the state. That's the exact words that the nurses use when they hand the mom a stack of papers. So without any full and honest disclosure of the terms and conditions of the securities contract, without a meeting of the minds, she signs as an informant. You ever looked at your birth certificates? Look at where the mother's signature is. It says signature of informant. What is the legal definition of the word informant? It is someone who gives someone else up to another. Police officer gets one of the 
little drug dealers and catches him up on something. And then for a little extra cash, he talks him into informing on the larger drug dealer. He becomes his informant. It's someone who gives someone else up to another. Okay? Thereby, under the false and fraudulent doctrines of parens patre, that's Latin, which means the state is the parent, and in loco parentis, which is Latin, for crazy parenting. Loco was crazy, crazy parenting. She unknowingly gives equitable title to the state's Department of Human Resources. As Bill Clinton signed executive order, I forget what number, it says human resources is the department that handles human capital. You're all capital, human capital. Forever to be known as human capital or chattel property, EI is slave. The named vessel, named vessel, a persona, is registered. I'm saying it this way on purpose. Star. What, what is registered? It's a flag. It's given a flag. The ship, the vessel is given a flag. It's registered. Okay? It's also given a CUSIP number, C-U-S-I-P, which is an SEC-regulated investment control number. And that's created. A SESTA QV trust is set up under the Public Charitable Trust. <coughs> the Public Charitable Trust is an umbrella trust. Inside the umbrella is all of us, 327.2 million people, SESTA QV trusts. Under the public charitable trust, it says we're supposed to be the co-trustee and co-beneficiary and only signatory officer. We are supposed to be the co-trustee, the co-beneficiary, and the only signatory officer under the public charitable trust. The government holds the public charitable trust. Then they did something with it. SESTA QV Act was originally started in England in 1666. The bubonic plague was going on. They burnt half the city down to, to kill the plague, kill the rats. They had to rebuild. Nobody had a home or businesses. London was burnt. They had to rebuild. So the government came up with the CQV, enslaved everybody, and they created, a, they bonded and insured them, created a monetary system based off the people's credit, their labor. The only thing we truly have is our labor, our works, right, as God says. And they created the Sestaqv Act. 1707, more company, countries adopt, adopted the Sesta QV Trust Act. We adopted it in 1933. So all your crown countries adopted it in 1777. All your commonwealths of England. All right? We adopted it in 1933. Edward Mandel House with a small group of bankers on Jekyll Island said, we know how to fund government forever. We can make it the biggest, largest, most powerful control group system in the world. We can control the world with our SESTA QV Trust Act. 
Okay. What does that do? It creates a balance sheet. Everybody knows what a balance sheet is, right? Debits and credits. Balance sheets must balance, right? So, on the debit side, if you were born between 1933 and 1975, the International Monetary Fund issued $630,000 of Federal Reserve notes and threw them out into the Public Charitable Trust for you to go out and earn and collect. They just printed a bunch of money, a bunch of paper. $630,000 worth in various denominations, and they threw it out there to the public. They also insured you for a million dollars. That's why your birth certificate's on bond paper. It's got a bank name on it. It's got a CUSIP number at the top. It's a, a bank actually bonded, insured, through our Federal Reserve System, usually the Great Northern Bank, and bonded and insured you as shadow property, $630,000, a million dollar insurance policy was the collateral for them to release the money. They had to be insured. Ah, the IMF ain't that dumb. Right? They want their money insured. If we're going to release 630000 we want to be insured. There's a reason I keep saying that. On the credit side, $630,000 worth of United States Treasury bonds are sold under the CUSIP number as an investment account. Guess what? It balanced. And this is insured. In 1975, the amounts were increased to 1 million and 2 million. Now guess what, you think that's the end of it? You also went out and got a social security number. They did the same thing. Social security number is a CUSIP number. You got a driver's license, it's a CUSIP number. A military ID, CUSIP number. Your advanced degree in college, your student ID number, as you improve in life, they think you're worth more money. So they bond you and insure you again, and again, and again. And they tie all those future CUSIP numbers back to the original birth number. They're all linked. That's certificate. Not that I know of. I'll just say it that way. OK? CUSIP numbers, debits, credits, a loan, this is a loan from the IMF. This is the United States Treasury issuing bonds. What are bonds? The full faith and credit of the United States government. You, all your labor. So, Guess what? What else is a CUSIP number? Court cases. Yeah. Yeah. I proved this in federal court in the Ninth District. Okay. I showed where all crimes are commerce. All crimes are commerce. You get arrested on a felony count of fraud. Two million dollars is taken from your Sesta QV trust by the court for one count. Two million per count. If you had four counts of fraud, that's eight million bucks. That's how much that court gets. The judge gets $95,000 in net retentions. 
I've proved this in federal court. Net retentions. That's a polite way of saying commission. The prosecuting attorney gets 50000 This is a judge, prosecutor. Now you have what? Defense attorney, the person defending you. Do you know the judge and the prosecutor chip in? They give him out of their share. It's supposed to be a four, but I can't write upside down. Twenty thousand each. Now you, and I'm using an actual case, paid your defense attorney twenty-seven thousand dollars. He wrote him a check to defend you. But on the back end, he gets forty thousand dollars if you're convicted. Whose side's he on? Right? It's called railroading. To lead someone down a narrow path or rail to a predetermined outcome or conclusion. I can read almost every court transcript in this country and show you the fraud of railroading. Because I know how to read court transcripts. I can see where people's motions have been denied. Their witnesses have been denied. Their legal documents have been ignored. They're not properly defended or defending themselves. Or their defense attorney is sitting on his tough, I'm trying to be nice here, because normally I'd cuss at that point because I get irritated and mad at this, and not objecting. He's not repudiating. He's not objecting to anything the prosecutor says. So you pay him to sit there, and if you say, hey, how come you didn't object? He says, Shh, not right now, we'll have our turn. See, his job is an actor to a turn. I'll get to you in just a sec. An actor to a turn is to get up on stage and act convincingly enough to make you believe in the plot and the character that he's playing. So he's acting as your buddy, your defense attorney, your best friend. And he's making you believe by his performance that he is not attorneying you. When he is attorneying you, what was the definition of a turn? To steal from one and turn over to another. He stole your life. Because for one felony counter fraud, that's worth two million in the court, you go to jail for five years. For four, you got 20 years. Okay. Are you mad yet? See, my job really here is to piss you off. Because if you guys don't get pissed off at what I'm saying, then you're not gonna do anything about it. You're gonna go home, watch TV, and watch the Razorbacks, and you're gonna, you're gonna go back to your daily life on Monday and go to work. Until you get darn good and mad, maybe you'll start doing something about it. And I ain't here for my breath. I'm here to teach the teachers. I'm going to go fishing someday. I'm not going to be doing this eight city a month thing and not even living a life at all. And I've been doing this a long time, and I'm getting tired. I love you guys. I'd keep doing it probably till the day I die. I'm not joking. But at some point in time, I might die. I almost did in March. And I'll tell you that story in a little while. But your job is to take the simplicity of the knowledge that I'm giving you, where you can sit down with a husband and wife in a restaurant on the back of a napkin and you can draw some of these little descriptions like this, and you can tell them about the public charitable trust and about where power comes from in this nation and about authority. And you can give them, you can piss them off. So they'll do something about it. 
It has to be simple. It has to be duplicatable. It can't be too complicated. We don't need to know about every writ of habeas corpus and writ of mandamus and error of coram nobis, and I can go on and on and on. Okay? We don't have to know that. What we need to do is we need to go out and get a whole bunch of people pissed off. And I'm serious. We have to. Because until they're good and mad about the things that are happening to them in their lives, what about foreclosures? What about your kids being taken, your grandkids being taken, without any due process of law? Both laws that set up Child Protective Services, Title IV and ASPA, say in the law that they cannot take your children from you without your consent. They can't do it, except for one exception. If you have been charged, tried, found guilty, and sentenced in proper due process of law to a felony, then they can come take your kid while you're in jail, and they must place it with a family member first. If there's no family members who will step up to the plate, then they can put it in a foster home because somebody's got to take care of the kids. I fostered two of them, okay? <sighs> Proper due process law must be followed. You're first, go ahead. I'm just curious about the public defenders. Do they make $40,000? Uh, no, that's your defense attorney. And it depends on the charge. It's <laughs> called a penal sum and they put it, all right. I'm going to answer this question because it's real important. I was going to do it tomorrow, but we'll do it today, and I won't have to do it tomorrow. I hope so. Because right. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you're not pissed off, you're not going to do anything. I'm sorry. You'll go home and watch TV. You'll get caught up in soap operas or whatever. All right? What is the new one uh, my wife watches? Oh, the, uh, the guys who run obstacle courses. Yeah, that's it. See, I don't watch TV. It's a waste of time. I don't watch sports either. Those were designed by the Romans to distract us so the Romans could steal everything the people had. And our country is doing the same thing. All right. A penal sum. The federal government, the district postal courts of the government, the court clerk is the head banker. The head court clerk at every federal district court is the head banker. Most people think it's the judge. No, no. it's the court clerk. Mary, in Portland, Oregon, at the 9th District Federal Court, which is seven states, by the way. Their headquarters is in Portland, Oregon. Mary, Judge Mosman's the head judge over all the other judges, but Mary controls the books. Okay? And she goes online with the Department of Fiscal Services. Who are they? Oops. Who are they? They're the accountants for the United States Treasury. That's the accounting department of the United States Treasury. They keep track of everything fiscal. Okay? And Mary, upon indictment, fills out an SF-273 form, which is a bid bond form upon indictment. What is an indictment? An indictment is a true bill. They're giving you an invoice. You have just been indicted. Here's your bill. 
That's what they did. And how many people are smart enough to go, well, how much is the bill? How much is it? Well, the penal sum you've been charged with for a count of fraud is $2 million. Oh, crap, I can't pay that bill. <laughs> I just don't have it, right? But that's what the indictment would say if they disclosed the money because that's the penal sum. This is the penal sum for that particular crime of fraud. That's how much the bill is on your indictment. But you can't pay the bill, and you didn't ask, bother to ask how much it was anyway. So they bring you up on charges. If you can't pay the charges, you're asked to bond. If you can't pay the bond, your body is held a surety while they steal from your SESTA QB trust. So in order to steal from your SESTA QB trust, she's got to do a bid bond. A bid bond says this person's been indicted, and there's a penal sum of $2 million on that. We're going to put in a bid bond. And on the bid bond, it's going to show, here's what a bid bond is. Let me explain what a bid bond is first before I go in more into what it's going to show. A bid bond is telling the United States Treasury that this person with this cuss-up number that's tied to the birth certificate cuss-up number, because here's our court case number, so now a cuss-up number, it's tied to the birth certificate number, the bid bond <coughs> is an order to begin liquidation of funds. You gotta remember what's inside your SESTA QV trust. United States Treasury bonds, that is not liquid capital. You can't whip it out of your pocket and go spend it right now. It's gotta be sold. So it's an order to the Treasury to begin to sell your bond, your US Treasury bonds. Start selling them. Create some liquid capital so that when we ask for it, and we ask for the wire transfer, you'll have it available. That's what it is. Now guess what? On the bid bond sheet is a settlement date. Not only is it a settlement date, but there's another date on there. So, there's a date to begin to sell. There's a date on there that says by this date, we're hoping you'll have the penal sum available. And by this date is the date we expect to settle the account. Three dates on the SF-273 that is done upon indictment. Now understand why I'm saying this and emphasizing it. You haven't been tried yet. You haven't been found guilty. You haven't been sentenced. Right? Guess what this date is? It will correspond to your sentencing date. This will correspond to your trial date. You haven't even been notified of your trial date yet, much less your sentencing date. This is upon indictment. Is this railroading? Is this a predetermined outcome or conclusion? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> upon trial, SF-274 form. Performance bond. That's saying, hey, we just found the guy guilty. You're going to have to perform, Treasury. That's what it does. Notifies them that you better have that penal sum ready because you're going to have to perform.
you go to sentencing, you get thrown in jail because your body is now held as surety for the bond. And she fills out the SF-275 form. That's a payment bond. You know what that is? It is a wire transfer order. And within, if courts sentencing is held at 9 o'clock in the morning, which they try and do, they'll get paid by 5. If it's later in the day, they'll get paid the following day. Direct wire transfer between the Treasury Department and the court, the federal court. Now, on the state level, looks a little similar, doesn't it? But this is out of the, instead of the Department of Fiscal Services, this is actually out of the GSA. So on the state, you go into the state court, court clerk fills out the same kind of a form, only on paper, and guess what? They sell it to the federal court. All lower courts sell to the federal court. The court buys the CUSIP numbers, which were bonded and insured, and they pay the state courts <coughs> through the GSA SF 23, 24, 25A form. Bid bond, payment, performance bond, and payment bond. Same exact thing. All the federal government did is added a two in front of it. <laughs> Well, no, they didn't. They added a seven in the middle. What am I thinking? I'm not. Don't listen to me. <laughs> no, that's all they did. It's added a two in the middle, seven in the middle. So this blueprint is why we have mass incarceration for profit. Thank you. Anywhere else in the world? Sure. Yeah, like you started out saying. This yeah. Is not, it's not free. <laughs> no. Look up your court. If you've got a court case coming up, who is your enemy? They're a private for-profit business owned by whom? Treasury. How many employees? No, not the no, they're not. They're just like a McDonald's franchise. The government sold every branch of government off. Some of them are owned by judges. That's right, some of them are owned by judges. What, what would happen if you found out your head judge in your county courthouse owned the courthouse? Isn't that supposed to be a public building? See, remember what I said, there are two of everything. There's the United States of America, the de jure government that lives inside each one of us, that President Trump, through executive order, admitted and restored. Okay? And then there's the United States Corporation. Two separate animals. There's the state of Arkansas, which is a corporation, and there's Arkansas, a de jure government whose seats are vacant. Okay. What were the common law offices that they could never get rid of? Technically, there's two and a half of them left. And the reason I say half is the half is the sheriff's department. The sheriff, only one of them, right? He's half because he's getting paid by the enemy and he's trying to be a de jure government so he's under conflict and one cannot serve two masters, okay? Then you have justices of the peace and notary republics. Look at your notary reforms very carefully. Your notary reforms can say state of Arkansas or they can say Arkansas state. They can say county of, what was it? Washington. County of Washington, or they can say Washington County. They can say notary, or they can say notary republic. Make sure you're using notary forms that describe the jurisdiction that you're in. Because otherwise you can walk in with the best sovereign document into a court, being in common law, and have the wrong notary form and the judge goes, ha, 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 I'm not going to tell you why, but you're mine, buddy. Right? When you say notary public, all, all that seems is notary public. 
There's both. A lot of them say notary. Yes, notary public, notary public, not republic. Yes, notary publics. That's a common law office, officer. If you take your notary public and you say as jurat certificate, and then uh, Arkansas State and Washington County, and you autograph it on the right hand side, by, now you've got a common law document, who's an officer of the court. So it's already accepted by the court the second the notary signed it. Most people don't know that. So they do their documents wrong. Go ahead. Franchises. What if uh, McDonald's bought Burger King? And then Burger King bought Wendy's. See? Just subsidiary corporations. States, which are all your counties included, work out of the GSA, and the federal works out of the Department of Fiscal Services. It's all the same stuff, and it's all sold to the feds. What's that? Who, who will the paperwork, the documents be found on who owns these courts? Will they be at the Secretary of State or will they be at that county courthouse? <laughs> they don't even register their, their corporations. Except in D.C. I'll bet you the state of Arkansas has an address at 444 West Washington Boulevard, Washington, D.C. North Capitol Boulevard. Okay, North Capitol. Okay, yeah, they have different addresses. Every, every state corporation is registered in D.C. as a subsidiary. Guess what? So is the United States. It's registered at, under the District of Columbia, which is registered under the Crown, Inc. How do you like them apples? David, is 273, SS 273, is that available by FOIA? Go to the Department of Fiscal Services website and you can pull up the blanks. See, the average American doesn't go to the Department of Fiscal Services website for anything. It is designed for court clerks to go to the Department of Fiscal Services website. And they ask questions, and you can learn a lot by the questions and answers. It'll show the questions if you click on them, and you don't know to do this, but if you click on them, It'll pull the answer up of the Department of Fiscal Services answering the court clerks. Like, what do you do with a case whose value is more than $100 million? And the Department of Services, when you click on it, because Mary asked that question during the Bundy trials, their case was valued at more than $100 million. That's how much the court would have got. Yeah. And guess what? Well, I was on Ryan Bundy's legal team and Shauna Cox's legal team, and we got them all off. Okay? It wasn't the darn attorneys that did it. It was Shauna Cox and Ryan Bundy who got them all off. You've got to understand that. Okay? So, why? Because we fired their attorney. We filed documents in court three times, answering the rule of three. See, Ryan Bundy, <laughs> he would carry his Bible and he would carry his Constitution into the courtroom. And the U.S. Marshals would confiscate it at the door. And he asked the judge one time, how come I can't bring my Bible and the Constitution into the court? She says, you're not a party to it. Well, that pissed me off. So I came into the picture with that comment. And I said, enough is enough. Ryan, we're going to make it an American state national. We're going to file in the county of your birth. We're going to send it to the Secretary of State. We're going to do a patent and nativity on you. We're going to do a deed of reconveyance on all your names in every which way, shape, and form. And we're going to get it done right now. And then I'm going to start filing documents in your court case. Ryan says, OK, let's do it. <clears throat> and he 
sat in jail for a while and he was tortured and we'd enter a document. And I knew the rule of three hadn't happened. He go, he's going, well, how come the document didn't work? I said, just hold on. Give us some time. I, I know this process. File another one. He goes, shoot, we filed two now. And now start, people from the outside are starting to attack us, right? You're screwing everything up, blah, 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 blah. And I said, I just shut up. Don't listen to them. We file another document. All three of them said about the same thing. We just said it in three different ways. And we established his status, his standing, challenged their jurisdiction. We pointed out the fraud. Guess what? There's no statute of limitations on fraud and jurisdiction, right? And we pointed it out. And so as soon as we got that third document filed, I said, Ryan, Monday morning, you've got a court hearing again. Here's what I want you to do. I said, I want you to stuff some toilet paper in the bottom of your pocket. and wore those orange jumpsuit suits with one pocket, right? Stick some toilet paper in the bottom because I want that Constitution sticking up as far as it can possibly stick up and walk into the courtroom and watch what happens. And he walks in, and the U.S. Marshal smile at him, shake his hand. They know this stuff. And the, the other attorneys for the other guys, and the only one, ones that went to jail were the ones that signed plea deals, by the way. Everybody else went home, the ones that refused to sign. And he walks in, and nobody took his constitution. And he sat down, and he watched the attorneys of the other guys question a federal witness most of the day he just sat there and they the last one got done and told the judge the defense rests and the judge looks over at Ryan and says Ryan and she smiled real big and she says Ryan would you like to question the witness Ryan hadn't been allowed to talk since the very first hearing Every time he went to a hearing, he couldn't talk. And now all of a sudden, the judge has asked him if he wants to question the federal witness. Shocked him to the core. But he said, yes, I do. And he walks up to the witness, and he says, how long have you been a federal officer? And the guy said, 22 years. And Ryan says, when you took office, did you swear an oath to the Constitution? And he says, yes, I did. And Ryan gets all cocky and he says, well, have you read it? <laughs> and the guy says, no. And so for three and a half hours, Ryan went through the Constitution with him and questioned him and asked him and corrected his answers when they were wrong until they, he agreed. Finally, Ryan says, I'm all done with this witness. And they left. And they all went back to jail. It went a half an hour over until 5.30. And they closed at 5. And they were religious about that. And it went a half an hour over. Thursday, after the Monday of that hearing, they came back for a hearing, and the case was dismissed. And everybody thought it was the Wooten memo. Well, let me tell you how dumb of that statement is. The Wooten memo was already brought up in motion and was denied. They couldn't bring it up. But some senator from the state of Washington got a hold of the Wooten memo and put it on national TV, and everybody thought the Wooten memo is the reason the case was dismissed. I'm here to tell you right now is because Ryan established a status standing in his jurisdiction, and he was able to talk about the Constitution. And from that moment on, it was a constitutional court of record with a summary judgment. That's simple. That's simple. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Is there any benefit to us? All these bonds that are released on us at our birth, or are they just used against us, so to speak? Well. Right now, they're used against you. Prior to 1999, we could get a few things paid off with our bonds. Most people since then who state that are lying to you or they end up in jail for fraud and doing it. Why? Because the country went through another bankruptcy in 1999. And they went through another one in 2011. 
This country just keeps going into bankruptcy, no changing no little else. tiny things, and then they hold the debt. The courts collect off this system a trillion dollars a day. I wasn't going to tell you that because it shocks people to the core. A trillion dollars a day, that's more in 25 days than our entire gross domestic product of the United States. Where is the money in this country? It's in the bond market. This ledger, this ledger, it's not gold and silver. It's not backed by gold and silver, no. It's backed by your labor. You are the full faith and credit of the United States government. All under that umbrella of the public charitable trust. All says the QB trusts are the full faith and credit of the United States government. All 327.2 million people. However, the majority of them all live in Washington, D.C., like you all. And the reason I'm telling you that is if you haven't repudiated your citizenship with the Secretary of State as Title VIII, Section 1101A21, a state national, the only one with limited diplomatic immunity as per the Geneva Convention, your status is in Washington, D.C. because of the sure way you write your address on your mail. If you put a zip code on your mail, you're in the District of the District of Columbia and you just reside as a resident in Arkansas temporarily to do business because that's the definition of the word resident. Someone there temporarily to do business. <laughs> See, I'm a people, a man, a living soul, a son of God, an inhabitant. Hmm? Citizen. No, I won't be a citizen of anything. It got perverted. And it's also with a low, low, lower C. In all of our United States documentation, it's a large C. And then it got perverted. City means municipal. Zen means society. We were supposed to be members of society. But they changed the definition to municipal instead of member. Got perverted. Now we can't be a citizen of anything. You're state national. You're in Arkansas. Can you talk about the path, David? <sighs> yeah, I was going to do that for tomorrow, but... Yeah, I remember. Previous <laughs> page. Passports? Mm-hmm. Are those the What's the Constitution say? It says to be safe in your papers and your effect. Are they issued papers you're talking about earlier? Your passport is your papers and your effect. That the Constitution, understand what a Constitution is. It's a compact. We the people lay down the law. How many people have read The Law of Nations by Vittel, besides him? What? One, two, three, three, four people have read The Law of Nations. <laughs> that is the first international law document ever written for international law. That's how nations were founded, how nations were set up. Hundred and ninety seven of them last count. So far fourteen of them backed out in Zurich in July when I was there. I got I got fourteen sovereign nations to sign a pact in Zurich last month. July. Not last month. We're in September. Month before last. I lose track. Yeah, fourteen sovereign nations so far. I'm I'm working on fifty. <coughs> David? Tomorrow we're going to talk about a passport, state national versus state citizen. So okay. you all can be aware that that's going to be answered directly, correct? If I don't, remind me. You will. Okay. It's hard to cover everything in a short period of time. And I'm also, I, believe it or not, as much as I've showed you already, I'm trying to keep it very simple and duplicatable. We can make this very complicated.
I'm saying don't. Well, uh, do you have any templates? Um, God, I hate that word. <laughs> I hate that word, template. Go by. Go by. <laughs> yes, I have 350,000 documents on this computer right here. And then some. Probably another 10,000 books on there. So, yeah, there's templates for everything. God, I hate that word. <laughs> Forms and templates. Those are the downfall. Never fill out a government form. Who wrote forms? Attorneys. Attorneys control government. They control the legislature. They have usurped every branch of government. Trump, in all the good that he tries to do while he's being beat to death, he has to run to attorneys to see if it's okay. Or he does it and then it goes to attorneys, and they either overrule him or they don't. But attorneys, bar members, control every branch of government. We're supposed to have four branches of government, right? No, five. People are freaking out right now. Five. We the people are the first branch of government. We're it. We the people lay down the law. It's that simple. That in which we, the people, create, we control. Maximum law. That in which one creates, one controls. And how come they're controlling you? Because they created the U.S. citizen. The 13th Amendment of the Constitution freed the black slaves, and the 14th Amendment of the Constitution made you all slaves and created the U.S. citizen, the person, the resident, the 10 districts, they expanded the 10 square miles of Washington, D.C. all across the United States into 10 districts of the District of Columbia. You don't believe me? Go to the state of Arkansas and get a federal indictment. And where are you tried? You're tried in the, what district is this? the 8th District of the District of Columbia. You're not tried in Arkansas. You might think you are, because you walked in a building somewhere on the map. But you're tried in the District of Columbia in a federal court. Why? Because you used your zip code on something. You said, I'm a citizen. You checked the box when you got your driver's license, your social security number, your, your passport, your voter ID, whatever. You check some darn box. You know, you, you committed a felony when you did that? It is illegal, according to the United States Code, to claim to be a citizen when you are not. And you did not go through the steps necessary, and we proved this in court too. There are certain steps necessary to become a citizen. If somebody comes from Mexico or Canada and they want to be a citizen of the United States, they have to go through certain steps to become a citizen. You have to follow those steps, and none of you did it. You're just claiming to be. And they let you get away with that felony because that's what they want you to be. Because then you're in their control. Is there a way around it? Yeah. We'll give you a thumbs up Sure. <laughs> sure. I feel like I'm the only free person in the country sometimes. Uh, right? My friend has their What's that? It's just being an American state national. In Title VIII, Section 1101 is your definitions of status. And you, each and every one of you, have the unalienable right of self-determination. Something nobody, no government can take away from you. God gave you the free agency. He gave you dominion over the land, air, and water. Okay? Which is the law. Jurisdictions. Okay, land, air, and water. I told that, right? No. no? Oh my gosh, where am I? That was last night. That was last night. That's what's messed me up. You know that, right? Yes. Okay, in Genesis 1 26 or 28, God gave me, man, dominion over the land, the air, and the water, and everything therein. 
It's his. It's not mine. I am the steward, the ambassador. I do his work, and I'm there to take good care of it. That's what I'm charged with. But he also did something else. He gave us free agency, the right of self-determination, to determine what was best. And sometimes we're screw-ups, and we make mistakes, right? But that's how we'll be judged. The land, and by the way, the Vatican confirmed all this starting in 1455 with the first three testamentary trusts signed over an 81-year period, setting aside, they didn't set aside nothing. God already gave it to us in the Bible. All they did is confirmed it, okay? And then I'm going to say that about the Constitution, about the anything. The uh, Constitution didn't give us any rights. We already had them. All they did is confirmed our rights. The jurisdiction of the land, the air and the water, and this is law. I, I started in the beginning, and I don't know how I got off track, but I said we were going to hold court. Who wants to be the judge? Remember that? This is what I, I've asked probably close to 300 judges and prosecutors, this question. What is the law? Where did its origins come from? How did we arrive at this thing called law where a small group of men could put something down on paper and hold me, a man, accountable? And then I shut up. I let them answer. And they screw it all up. They get it wrong every time. Most of them are compartmentalized legal idiots, and they don't know. And that's what we all are. We're all compartmentalized legal idiots in every job we do, in everything we do, because we don't know the big picture. We're compartmentalized. See, if I'm a con man, and I want to pull off a con job, and I want to rip off a million people, and I've got to hire 100 people to help me do that, if I told them what the con was, they'd all quit. Why? Because people are basically good, honest, and moral people. So what do I do? I need them to help me. I compartmentalize them. You're the getaway driver, and you break down the door, and you hit the vault, and you watch the people. Whatever. I'm using those as stupid examples, but you compartmentalize them. Well, that's our county clerks, and our real estate agents, and our cartographers, and our our appraisers and our, our mortgage brokers and our court clerks, and that's how they steal your house from you on behalf of the state. You put them all together as a conspiracy to defraud, and I can prove it. It's also, in another realm, it's our police officers and our prosecutors and our you know, defense attorneys and our judges and our court clerks, and they do a conspiracy to defraud, and I can prove it, and on and on and on. If I want to pull off a con job, I just got to compartmentalize everybody. And then I can go rip them off and rip off millions of people. Okay? And a small group of greedy bankers ran, counseled by Edward Mandel House on Jekyll Island, set up this whole plot based upon little things England did years before because Mandel House studied it. He didn't just make it up one day. <laughs> Okay, he followed the leader, but he was smart enough to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. See, the government hides everything in plain sight. Right. Everything. Everything is in print. It's all hidden in plain sight. They just don't put it in one book. They put this little piece of the puzzle in this book, in this law, and this little piece in this law, and they put it up. It's guys like me who read it all, study it all, put the pieces of the puzzle together, Try and reduce it down to the simplest so I can teach you. That's it. I didn't make this stuff up. Not in my wildest dreams could I have thought of this. I had to learn it. <laughs> All right? So, got off track. I didn't even finish the story of the mother. That was terrible. Land, air, and water. The land is common law, 
Anybody see what I did with my pen? Uh, Now, I want to tell you something. The air is higher than the land, and if you go into the water, you're going to drown and die. It's that simple. The land is common law, common to all mankind, set aside by the First Testament Trust of 1455, with the trustee given to King Ferdinand of Spain. King Ferdinand of Spain was in charge of all the land in the world. So he built a fleet of ships to go collect his treasure. And We'll talk some about that too. Common to all mankind. It is property, rights, property. How did I do this? Equity. And equity. Rights, property, and equity. The jurisdiction of the air is ecclesiastical or canon law. which is trust law. The water is admiralty or commerce, which is contract law. That's it. That is our three jurisdictions. Juris means right law. Which of those three is the right law that we're talking about, that we're standing under, that we're in this situation? Juris. Diction means words. You look words up in the dictionary. The words you use determines the right law under which you stand. Land, air, or water. So one Mr. Prosecutor a minute ago misused the word jurisdiction on purpose to confuse the general public and everyone else in this courtroom when he said it was in the county's jurisdiction. What he really meant to say was locus or venue, location or venue. It's in the county's venue. Why? Because it doesn't matter if you're in the city, the county, the state, the federal government, this agency or that agency, they all operate in one jurisdiction, contract law. We, the people, can create a private trust, and we can operate in ecclesiastical or canon law. We, the people, can not harm our neighbor. Love thy neighbor and do no harm. You can break no other law. And we would be in common law. We can have a land patent and we cannot go into foreclosure. See, if you're going into foreclosure, it's because of a contract. And it's because they stole your property probably before you even bought it. And definitely the day you bought it. You haven't owned a house in your whole life unless you hold a land patent. All property shall be in land patent. All property shall be described in meets and bounds. Not lot 27 of block 3 of Spring Hill Subdivision, Fayetteville, Arkansas. <laughs> what, did, what did I just say? I said the county cartographer and the county appraiser and the county tax assessor re-describe your property as commercial, industrial, or residential property which are all commercial terms, and stole your private property from you by re-describing your property as Lot 27 of Block 3 of Spring Hill Subdivision, Fayetteville, Arkansas. And they took the land patent number off of your invoice, and they put a lot block and tax number on there. And they put your person name and your address with the, in the District of Columbia. And they made all manner of errors and they sent it to you as a tax statement, which is an invoice, and you looked at the invoice and you wrote them a check and you paid it, so you agreed to the contract. And you acquiesced and they stole your property. In fact, until, it wasn't until I owned a real estate company, two mortgage companies and a title company and two land development companies, and I had a construction company and a specialty building supply company all at the same time, 
and I was running all these companies that I learned that a title officer, when a husband and wife comes in to sign their mortgage documents and they get all done, the title officer is trained to say, and how would you like to hold title? And you look at each other and you say, I don't know, what are our options? And she says, well, most husbands and wives hold title and joint tenants in common. And you look at each other and you go, hmm, husband, wife, that's joint, yeah. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> joint is husband and wife. Tenants is renter. Common is state. Joint renters to the state. Geez, that's how you hold title. And then you get foreclosed on and you wonder why. You could walk into court with all the proof of fraud you want on the, on the mortgage company and the mortgage broker and the judge rules for who? The mortgage company or the mortgage broker against you. Because he doesn't want to tell you you didn't own your property in the first place. I don't know, slap yourself, say you were stupid and call it a day. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm just saying, that's what happens, right? We didn't know any better. It's not our fault. Somebody so at some land patent. It's land private patent. property. How do you call land patent? It's already there. It's already there. Yeah. All properties are in land patent. Okay. I just looked one up in Pennsylvania for a guy and helped him file his land patent, and it was land patent number 402 signed by James Madison. Wait a minute. Oh, no. okay. The 402nd land patent issued in the state of Pennsylvania, in the United States was in the state of Pennsylvania. <laughs> Gosh, the 11th hour and 55th minute is a good time. So, there's an underlying land patent. It's land patent number 23, 47, a part and parcel thereof described as from, the, from this township and this range, yeah, meets and bounds, 497 feet to this corner and whatever, right? You put the meets and bounds description. Not a description that says lot 27 of block three is Spring Hill subdivision, Fayetteville, Arkansas. Ah, yeah, you see? And they don't even use Arkansas, they use AK or AR. <laughs> AR, I was in Alaska for a minute. Okay, you see what I mean? They make all kinds of errors. See, we only have two jobs. We only have two jobs in life. One is to correct the errors our public servants make, and the other is to educate them so they never do it again. <laughs> Unfortunately, those are full-time jobs. No, go to the cartographer's office somewhere. Go to the title company's office. Go to... Go, go to your county land records. Somewhere there became an abstract of title. Most abstracts are garbage. What's that? Most abstracts are garbage. Everything is an abstract now. A warranty deed is an abstract of title. I think most of them have been burnt by title companies. Oh, well. You're, 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 you're talking about not abstracts. Yeah, what they're using now is abstracts. See, a land patent has to have a grant deed to his heir, successors, and or assigns. Anything from the dirt down is the land. Everything that's an improvement is real estate. So a real estate come in, agent comes in and lists your property. He's selling everything from the, or he or she is selling everything from the ground up and just giving the land away under some kind of abstract of title. Did you know that? Yeah. Here I got this great piece of dirt over here and they're selling me the improvements. That's what a real estate contract is. Real estate is the improvements. It's an estate, it's the heir. You can't have an estate on something God created. He can give us dominion over that and we can be good stewards of that, but it ain't inherited to me. The stewardship is what's inherited. His heirs, successors, and or assigns. 
Real estate is sold. Land patents can't be sold. They must be granted. That's why a grant deed. A grant deed is the only real deed. Everything else, a, a quick claim, a, a warranty deed, those are all abstracts of title. See? And we wonder why our house gets foreclosed on. I lost $9 million in real estate between 2008 and 2010. I gave most of it back to the banks. If I would have known that then. Now I have three pieces of property and they're all under land patent. We're going to talk processes tomorrow. I'm trying to give you some basic education, as much as I can give in a short period of time, to try and teach you to be teachers, to talk to people in simplicity. Now, I know I've covered a lot of crap today. And that doesn't seem right now in your brain, because your brains are starting to go, <laughs> that it's simple. But believe me, this is about as simple crayon as I can get, all right? And this, this is the issue. So we're holding court. There's three types of law. Three jurists. Now there's diction. that determines which juris you're in. Let me say two sentences. Both sentences are going to mean the same thing, going down a road in a car. Okay? First sentence is, as a free man, I can travel in private upon the highways with nothing but my passport as my papers and my protection, and I am lawful. Pay attention to the words, the diction. Second sentence. As a citizen, I can drive or operate a motor vehicle with my driver's license, insurance, proof of registration upon the roadways. As long as I'm following all the statutes, I am legal. See, if I walked into a Chevy dealership, I happen to like Chevys, and I drive Chevy Silverado pickups at home, have five of them. I used to have 26. That's another story. And if I walk into a Chevy dealership and I want to buy a brand new Chevy Silverado, and I whip out $70,000, and I set it on the desk, do all the paperwork, he'll say, great. Salesperson smiling, he's going to make a good commission that day. I'm happy, I've got my brand new truck. And then he says something to me that makes me mad. He says, I need another $185 for license, title, and registration. And I get out and I write him a check, and I hand him the $185 check. I just gave the state of Oregon my $70,000 truck as a gift. Wasn't that nice of me? Now they're going to give me a certificate of title back that's going to give me the opportunity to make a profit or incur a loss in the lease of that vehicle. That's how, what it says in the law. An opportunity to make a profit or incur a loss in the lease of that vehicle. But the state owns it. They've got the manufacturer's statement of origin. Or if you drive a BMW, a Porsche, a Volvo from a European, it's a manufacturer's certificate of origin, MCO or MSO. And the state owns that. And the state holds on to it. And they give you a certificate of title, which is an abstract of title. Okay. I used to do that with your gold or silver between 1933 and 1935, too, under the fine or imprisonment of $10,000. Yeah, my grandfather was a geologist for the state of California. He gave over a million dollars worth of gold, surrendered it. Right, right. See, that's why I have some silver right here. 
People say, hey, you don't use real money. I say, yes, I do. He's got the Liberty Bell right there. That's my Liberty. Okay. But that's the issue. We operate off Federal Reserve notes, which is legal tender. It does not pay off or discharge a debt. It tenders it to a later date. Remember when I was doing the balance sheet? Should have went into this a little more in depth. But I keep thinking I'm going to run out of time, right? So I don't cover everything as thoroughly as I wish I could because we'd be here a while. But it tenders it to a later date. They keep track of it through your bank statements and your tax returns. Everything that you spend. See, the story of a mother, when you reach 18, your job is to go out there in the world, gather up as much as that Federal Reserve note loaned that the IMF gave as you can, and then go out and spend it. And all that thing, you bought a $200,000 house and a $70,000 Chevy Silverado and $50,000 worth of utilities over your lifetime, and it's all kept track of through your bank statements. Every time you, that's why you have to have a Social Security number, EIN number, or TIN number to open a bank account, because they report to the Federal Reserve. They keep track of your Social Security trust, all your debit side, everything you spend, everything you make. All right? Some of these doctors that go out and make $2 million a year or more, their CQV is worth billions of dollars because they just keep assigning more custom numbers. This guy's good. I'm just going to invest in him. I'll buy some more bonds and reinsure him and give him another custom number he doesn't know about. And if the government's not getting enough money out of the trillion dollars a day they take out of the court system in the United States, the Department of Fiscal Services tells you that the Department of Justice is the largest contributor to the federal budget by far. See, here's something I did last night. I drew a little circle with a little pie. And I said, this is our taxes. And this is the federal government's budget. And then we got a little bit more on tariffs, and that's grown because of Trump. These are tariffs, and these are taxes. Tax and tariff, right? Where's all this money come from? Department of Fiscal Services will tell you the Department of Justice is the biggest contributor to the federal budget by far. One trillion a day. And we think our taxes buy roads. No, your gas tax buys roads. Every time you go to the pump. Roads are highways. They're postal roads. They're free. We support them with our gas that we purchase. See, the, we ask the federal government, we the people ask the federal government to provide us with 19 essential governmental services and no more. And the and no more I feel for you. That's hard sitting this long. I, I, I understand your pain, okay? 19 essential governmental services and no more. That's the contract we signed called Compact that we went through our states as state nationals, we the people, and the states got together and signed the Constitution, the Compact or contract with the federal government, asking the federal government to provide 19 essential governmental services and no more. That's the most important part of it, and no more. How many do they provide us with today? Oh, man. And they force us at gunpoint to pay for it. Right? The free phones. Right? All kinds of services, privileges they provide. Who wants a privilege? Every time you get a privilege, you give up a right. I'd rather have my rights than my privileges. I don't want any privileges. Okay? 